Good evening. Good evening. On this cool evening, I'm so happy to see so many of you out and about, so it's uh, wonderful. Uh, today, uh, this evening and tomorrow's sermons uh, begins a series of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And uh, tonight we're going to be hearing Jesus say, blessed are, and you know he goes on to all kinds of different things. But that word blessed... Uh, isn't just meaning that God's blessing us with something, but that inside of us, too, there's a, a feeling of joy and happiness. And when we have Christ as our Savior, that, that blessing we know will always be there with us. Uh, we're going to begin with the hymn, As With Gladness, Men of Old. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. 
we confess our sins. We've come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we've disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, we confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. God, look with mercy on our weaknesses, and in all our dangers and needs, stretch out the right hand of your majesty to help and defend us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Continue with our lesson. The first lesson is written in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, and also chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame. For all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. This is God's word. song. 
it will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is God's word. Hallelujah, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. lesson is written in Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 12. This will also serve as the basis for our sermon. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you. be seated. This time we have a children's message. Uh, there's some children that would like to come up. 
come up to the first pew on this other side? Anybody interested? All right. So great to see you. That's a good place to be. That's fine. Sure. All right. Well, thanks for coming up. All right. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about forgiveness of sin. Now, what is a sin? We hear about sin all the time, don't we? But do you think any of you would know what a sin is? God says, this is what you should do, right? And we go, I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. I want to do something bad. Like, you know, I don't want to listen to mom or dad. I don't want to, I want to tell the truth. I, you know, just all kinds of things. And, and so if, if we were marking down the number of things that we either said or did wrong every day, you know, here's a list, right? We'd start to go, oh, oh uh, yep, I, I didn't listen to mom and dad. I'll write one down for that. And then maybe another one. And pretty soon, you know, we're going to have quite a few on the page, wouldn't we? Of all the things that we've said or done wrong in a day. As a matter of fact... It probably would look more like this, at least in my life. Whoa, that's a lot of sins. That's a lot of things that we've done wrong. And God doesn't like one of those things that we're doing wrong because he's holy and he wants us to be like him. So what do we do? We can't really pay for these. We can't get a permanent marker. We can't erase them. How do we get rid of our sins? We don't have to. Because that's why God sent Jesus, right? He sent Jesus to take away all our sins. And thinking about that on this next, on this next sheet, if I can get to it. Right? Here's Jesus. How many sins does Jesus have? Do you see any on there? See any marks at all? No. Jesus lived a perfect life. He never sinned. When he was your age, he listened and he did everything right. When he was a teenager, he did everything right. When he was an adult, he did everything right. He never sinned. God was so pleased with him because Jesus was always doing exactly what God wanted him to do, just like he wants us to do, but we can't do it. So what happens, of course, is that Jesus then takes that innocent life, that perfect life, and he, and he dies on a cross. And by doing that, by making that as an innocent sacrifice, he's taken away all our sins. It's like he took a giant eraser and went over all those sins that were all listed on the page there, and they're gone. And so now we have Jesus' forgiveness for you. And there's nothing on there anymore. He doesn't hold anything against you. He loves you as his dear child. God does. All through Jesus. What a blessing it is. Let's have a little prayer. So... Fold your hands. We'll pray. Close your eyes. Thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus. Even though he was tempted in many different ways, he never sinned. He always lived and loved for us. And now, once he died, he took away our sins. They're all gone. And everything is right between you and us. We thank you for sending Jesus and know that he is with that he is with us at all times thank you in jesus name amen all right you can go back to your seats
grace and peace are yours from God our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We've already read our gospel lesson. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Dear Lord, you've set high standards for us to keep as we serve you in this world. Forgive us for the times we have failed to live up to your standards. And give us power and faith in your love and forgiveness to grow in joyfully serving you and others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear redeemed of the Lord, have you ever felt guilty when hearing the Bible about especially the heroes of faith? Take, for example, Job. I mean, he lost almost everything. Even all his children, his ten children died. But he remained patient, and he trusted in God. And then you think, or at least I do, how many times have I lost my patience over something that is so minute compared to what Job had to go through? Remember the woman Ruth? She was a foreign woman who had learned about the true God through marrying her husband, who was an Israelite. And after her husband died, God was still so important to her that she was willing to leave her country and all of her relatives and live with God's people in Israel. She just wanted to be faithful to God. And again, I think, hmm, how great is our love? How great is our faithfulness to God? What are we willing to sacrifice for him compared to her? Consider Daniel taken exile from Israel to Babylon while living in this foreign land, he's commanded to stop praying, which was just part of his worship of God. And so what does he do? Knowing he could be thrown to the hungry lions, he stands up on his balcony in front of everybody. He raises his hands in prayer. <laughs> and he says, you're not going to stop me from worshiping and calling on the name of the true God. How bold are we when it comes to practicing our faith? How many times have we not been quiet when we should have spoken up about what we believe in a God who saves us? There's a lot of other examples, but I'll think of just one more. Proverbs chapter 31. Every once in a while on Mother's Day in my active ministry, I would read this, and I was thought, it sort of puts a guilt trip on, on women, wives, and mothers. But I'll summarize it, right? This woman of this household gets up before dawn, and she prepares all the meals for the whole day for her family. While the kids are gone, she's working at home, doing all kinds of different jobs to bring income in for the family. And it says she's still up late at night sewing to provide clothes for her family. Now, her children get up in the morning. You'd think, oh, they're going to be grumpy. No, they praise her, and they're so thankful to her. They show her love, and her husband daily praises her as well. What kind of a household is this, we might think. And I think when I was a child, for the children here, how often have you stopped and said, Mom, thank you for all you do? How often have we praised those who are married? How often have we praised our spouses for the wonderful things they're doing? You know, wouldn't any Christian mother or wife not feel guilty hearing about this perfect woman who lives in a perfect home? Yeah, I think we do. At least, you know, for those that apply to me, I admit it, sometimes I feel guilty. Well, today we're hearing the start of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to his disciples. And do we feel guilty as we hear him teach? He starts with the word blessed. And again, that's supposed to be making us feel better. Like, hey, there's a happiness I can have inside because I'm listening to Jesus. 
Well, we may listen, but are we really following? So he said, blessed are those who are humble, who show mercy, who have a pure love for God and for other people, and they show it in their lives. And thinking of that strong faith of the earlier believers, thinking of what Jesus calls us to be and do in this Sermon on the Mount, we should pray, Lord, give us faith in Jesus to live. Now, first of all, Jesus offers blessings if we do what he says. Sure sounds like it, doesn't it? We'll start back at verse 3, where Jesus said that the poor in spirit will receive the kingdom of God. He wasn't describing a physical poverty, that the poor, just by being poor, are going to inherit the kingdom of God, but that the poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God. Poor in spirit means that we realize our sins, that it's like a terrible debt to God. It's like I was showing the children before with all those marks of sin on there. Who is going to pay for those? We can't. We have empty hearts. We have empty hands most of the time. We're like the tax collector who was in the temple, right? He just beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and forgive me. That's all we can do. Well, Jesus also said, now in the next verse, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Be sad about sin. Be sad. Like Peter, after he had denied knowing Jesus, wept bitterly. What do we mourn to? When we see that our, our, that our sin can do such harmful things in the world, we grieve to see a world that's affected by sin, whether it brings sickness or hatred or fighting or death. Where is our comfort? Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This phrase seems a bit odd in our country, doesn't it? Because we're, we're the ones that say, hey, you've got talents, get out there aggressively and use them and, and uh, make any means, use any means possible to get ahead. But godly meekness isn't about what we can do for ourselves. It's, it's how to serve others. Like Ruth, who so faithfully cared for her mother-in-law. In the next verse, you know, verse 6, Jesus said, that we are blessed if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, for we will be filled. Now in life, hungering and thirsting, those are major drivers, right? Like, I can go for a little while without eating, but not going too long before I'm really going to be looking for food, right? And the same for you. It's a force that drives people to do actions. You know, Peter had that kind of same illustration when he said, like newborn babies crave spiritual milk. Jesus, later on in this same sermon, is going to say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We need that strong desire to hear God's word and to value that we have been baptized into Christ and that we can receive his body and blood to assure us of full forgiveness in the Lord's Supper, just as Jesus commanded. Verse 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I read this somewhere in a commentary. Mercy looks at what people need, not at what they deserve. How about that? Can we hear it again? Mercy looks at what people need, not at what they deserve. Mercy means to have compassion and forgiveness for others, even if they've wronged us. Immediately came to mind as I'm studying this, the Good Samaritan. Right? He finds this guy beaten and laying alongside the road. He thinks, yep, he's probably a Jewish person who hates Samaritans. I should just walk on by. Right? What does he do? Picks him up, puts him on his donkey, takes care of him, spends a small fortune. And he knows he's never going to get anything back from it. That's showing mercy. So, Jesus says, 
Be merciful like that. Right? Verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think of King David after he sinned, committing adultery and murder, and he wrote Psalm 51, Create in me a pure heart, O God. You know, all he wanted to do is focus, have his heart focused on God alone. And Jesus is telling us to have a pure heart that will value what his word says and not get distracted by so many other things that are out in the world with a pure heart. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to pretend that we're better than somebody else. It means that we will speak the truth in love. And blessed, in verse 9, are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Peacemakers. People that try to unite rather than divide. They're not quarrelsome. They're seeking peace as if peace was a treasure, <laughs> a valuable treasure. And they seek to build up people rather than to tear them down. And they pray that strife between other people and will end. Yet at the same time, they don't compromise the truth. I mean, not even Jesus was willing to say, I'll be at peace with you, you Pharisees, because they were teaching falsely, they were judging falsely. There's no way that he could compromise the truth just to have peace, and neither should we. Jesus then said, blessed are those who are persecuted for, because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There will be times when people reject us or hate us because we are the confessing the truth of God. Jesus went on to say in the following verses 11 and 12 that you know, we wouldn't be alone in this. That the Old Testament prophets had the same things that they had to face as they spoke for God. And think of Jesus himself. who even was crucified because people didn't accept the truth. They just didn't want to hear it. So you have Jesus' Sermon on the Mountain. It was a summary of many things that God expects of his people, at least that we should be reflecting these things because we get all these things, right, from God, mercy and kindness. But if our entrance into heaven depended on keeping Jesus' words, none of us would get in. We can't be perfectly poor in spirit. We don't always mourn for our sins the way we should. We're not always meek. And we don't have a perfect hunger for God's righteousness. Too often we're not merciful even towards our own family, let alone some stranger that we would meet along the way. We don't have a pure heart to live at peace. We must admit our guilt for our sin and look to Jesus. Well, second... Only Jesus could live to give that life to us. As our substitute, yes, Jesus was poor in spirit. He humbled himself. He became obedient. The Lord of life became obedient to death, even death on a cross, to win the kingdom of God for us. He lived a perfect life and sacrificed that life to erase the sins that condemned us all. He perfectly mourned as he saw the devastating effects of sin in the world. And then he won a place for us in heaven so that we will be comforted, not just for a day or an hour, but forever. Jesus did not, he was meek. And so he didn't defend himself when he was led to trial and eventually executed. He literally hungered and thirsted on the cross in order for us to have the experience of eternal fullness and well-being in our loving God while we're in heaven with him. Jesus did show mercy to all people. Just a few examples. Think of the Garden of Gethsemane. A troop, an army comes, and one of the servants is along to arrest him. Gets his ear cut off, and Jesus says, Oh, I'll heal you. I'll heal you that you're about to arrest me and have me killed, but I'm going to heal you. That's mercy, isn't it? Well, on the cross, what's the first thing he says? 
Father, forgive the one that just put the nail through my, my wrist. That's mercy. God saw us. Too. He has forgiven our sins. Jesus was constantly helping people, healing people, those who were considered sinners, and he gave them a new life. He has forgiven our sins, and he's brought daily blessing to our lives, though we don't deserve any of them. Everything Jesus did was with a pure heart of love for God and love for us. Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker, wasn't he? For he not only settled arguments among his disciples, apparently they didn't get along real well, but he helped them with that. But he also went between God and us and made peace. Our holy God could not accept us as we are with all our sin, and he saw us as enemies deserving death. So Jesus suffered our death, and he died to satisfy God's justice and turn his anger away. Now in Christ, we have only a loving God who wants to work everything in our lives for good. You know, even if we experience difficult problems, and yes, they certainly come in this world, but we know that Jesus loves us, that he will show mercy to us, so we should never lose heart. And so, when we think of Jesus' sermon, what he expects of us, don't be surprised to feel some angst of guilt. It's not hopeless. We are, Jesus is working through his word to help us to repent. He's working through his word to call us to faithfulness. We're not going to be perfect in this world. That's why we have a savior. But we are called to serve and to reflect the goodness that we have received from him. His powerful love for us and his promise to be with us to give us his strength and love will help us. He said in John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him is the one who bears much fruit. Despite our shortcomings, and we all have, we trust in him, not only to save us, but to accomplish much good through us. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. And now, the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with our confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll have our offering, and if you have not done so, please fill out the connection card.
please stand for the prayer of the church. We include two special prayers. One, Duane and Bonnie Hoyer are, have had 55 years of marriage. They're celebrating their anniversary. We'll have a prayer for that. Also, uh, Bruce Berner unexpectedly was called to heaven this last Monday. His funeral is going to be held here at St. Paul's on Saturday at 11 a.m. I'm sure you'll find more information online. Uh, let us begin with the prayer of the church. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You've given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich treasure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad. Calm those who are distressed. And comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold office of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is danger, let it be healing. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help. Heavenly Father, comfort the family of Bruce Berner, whom you have now called to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making him your child in baptism and sustaining his faith through the good news of Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the blessings you brought to your church, the community, and, and his family through his life of Christian service. May the peace and promise of your son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring assurance to the hearts of all who mourn. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves, reunite us with Bruce and all believers, and fill us with perfect bliss in your presence forever. Eternal God, your love endures forever with mercy and might you have sustained Dwayne and Bonnie Hoyer with blessing upon blessing as they now give you thanks for their 55 years of marriage. You've been the source of the strength that they have enjoyed and the spring of the faithfulness they have shared. As they rely on you for every good thing, we ask that you continue to go with them as their God and Lord. Preserve their faith by your word. Consecrate their hearts to your service and to each other, and lead them forth in your peace. Hear us, Lord, as we bring to you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
welcome again to all of you this evening. I was asked to read a letter which is acknowledging a call. Mrs. Natalie Eckstein from Lesseur, Minnesota, has been called to be one of the teachers at Jesus Loves Me Learning Center. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ at St. Paul Lutheran, I am both humbled and excited to have received the call to become a part of the mission of Jesus Loves Me Learning Center. How wonderful the work is to be with young children and to partner with their families. I ask for your prayers for divine intervention as my family and I deliberate this call. I will also keep St. Paul Lutheran and Jesus Loves Me Learning Center in my prayers and sincerely seek his guidance in where he may lead. I would welcome the opportunity for questions and insight from you regarding this call. All my best as I wait on the Holy Spirit's guidance, Mrs. Natalie Eckstein. Any other announcements that I don't know about? All right. The Lord be with us till we meet again.